Growth Pains. Hi, welcome everyone to this new episode of Growth Pains. Uh, today we'll be talking about topics such as not being good with data in a data-obsessed world, struggling with creating efficient processes, being a slow learner, and the impact of the current pandemic in the event business. For that, my guest today is Vasil Azarov. He's the founder of the Growth Marketing Conference, one of the most influential marketing conferences out there. He's also the co-founder of Startup Socials, a global community of entrepreneurs that connects and empowers professionals working in the startup ecosystem. And he also advises several organizations when it comes to people and events. Vasil, how are you doing today? Doing great, Nacho. Thanks for having me on your show. Thanks for coming, man. It's a, it's a journey. We're learning, right? We'll see how, how it turns out. But so far, it's been fun. Um, I, you know, I, I usually start this with like a little bit of a true or false kind of section. Um, try to make it somehow funny, somehow ironic. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but let's see how it goes. <laughs> so the idea is that I give you a short statement and you just give me like your short take on that and then we keep going, okay? Let's do it. All right, man. So when you walk the hallways of a marketing event and everyone is telling you how great they're doing, 80% of that is bullshit. True or false? Um, nah, so, no half ways. <laughs> no half ways. <laughs> you can justify it afterwards, but just lean one or, for one or the other. You know, I, I, I would say it's false. Okay. Okay. This is only about how they're doing, right? Like, how's your business doing? I'm growing amazingly and all this kind of stuff, right? But okay. Yeah. You stand your ground on that one? Yes. All right. Cool. The next one. The event industry will go back to 100% normal by mid-2021. True or false? False. What's your vision on that one? Yeah, so based on what we've seen right now, events are not coming, in-person events are not coming back, at least in the shape or form that they were before, probably for another 12 to 18 months. That's what I'm seeing based on the surveys, based on the yeah. my conversations with other event organizers. I'm not saying that events are not coming back, period, but events will As come we back. Used to know them. Yeah, they definitely there would be some smaller events, smaller in-person mixers. There would be hybrid events with a big virtual component, but the events as we know them, in-person events as we know them, will never be the same again. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and the last one, so we can keep then over going to your heartfelt pains. Uh, most attendees of marketing events value the content much more than they do the networking. True or false? False. Definitely 100%. <laughs> I thought you false. were going to save them apart. I thought you were going to say on the first one true and then the, the other way around. But okay, interesting. You see, like, I, I was able to surprise you today. Is it, yeah. <laughs> Is it the networking more, you think? Yeah. So, and... It's in definitely to the higher degree for in-person events than for virtual. Right now, everybody emphasizes content as a really important element of virtual event. Absolutely. Yeah. And I agree. But networking, I think, eventually would become more prominent um, for virtual events as well. So it's, it's always, in our industry, it might be a little bit... Well, in marketing industry, it's really easy to find high-quality content on YouTube if you follow the trends. And to be honest, some of the high profile speakers, uh, they always talk about the same thing over oh, and shit. over again. You're going to get in trouble with so, this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's whether like if you are, uh, and nothing is wrong with it. It's still different experience. If you watch somebody on the stage delivering keynote, that's a different energy, right? If you can get, talk to the speaker uh, afterwards. But content wise, it's actually better to really sit down in the quiet room and take notes yeah. Right, rather than being distracted by the noise and everything else. But what's the most important about conferences and events is people that you meet, and uh, meeting the right people is the key. Having these conversations, you know, at the bar at two o'clock in the morning when you really ready to share all your secrets. Yeah, that's that's where the majority of value comes from. Well, that's how we met. Right, we met a few years back. You were doing an inter uh, an event in Milano here in Italy uh, with, with the guys, I don't remember, well, uh, Luca, I don't remember the other guys, sorry guys, Rafael. Um, and um, I was speaking at that event. My, I was doing a talk called uh, The Bullshitizing Growth. So this is still, yeah. my, this is still my, uh, my mission in life, I guess, to remove some of the bullshit out of our profession. Uh, That's how I remember your keynote. One. That's how it stood out. Big it, time. it was a good time. I, I had a really good time. It was a really good trip. Uh, I also 
a guest in another episode. I also met him there, so you'll, you'll get to see that one soon as well. But it was a really good time. So um, I also try to get people a little bit uncomfortable on the first question, which would be the one I ask in every episode, which is one thing work-related that you think that you're really, really bad at. Pick one for now yeah. and we discuss the others. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, there are so many things that I'm bad at. Um, <laughs> And so I ha it's hard for me to choose just one, but uh, maybe we can start with something that the most uh, non-obvious as a founder of Growth Marketing Conference, I'm definitely far from being data-driven. Yeah. And n now, you know, <laughs> I, I would like to explain myself if anybody still wants to come to Growth Marketing Conference, but the floor is yours. Um, I, I feel that um, there are two uh, sort of sides of uh, growth marketing, the creative one, uh, brand storytelling part, as well as uh, data driven one, right? And uh, interesting enough, something that resonated with me the most is the keynote by Andy Jones uh, last year at the growth marketing conference. And he talked about that. He else also agrees with you that growth hacking is bullshit in <laughs> a way. And but the big idea was that some of the biggest companies that will appear this year and you know in next year and the years to come uh, would not be the ones who are iterating um, by experimenting and trying to grow uh, you know two percent three percent week of uh, after week by running these experiments yeah but really who would focus on the major innovation in the product right and that's why when it kind of, if you whether you're a product manager or growth person, what is really important in addition to uh, running successful experiments, measuring them uh, to the to our tiny details and iterating on them, is really yeah. to see the big picture, big opportunity, and understand customer value. Be really creative in your approach. So I think this is something that I'm excel at. I hate Google Analytics. You know, since I remember my first internship back in the days, I, I was like, struggling to put together meaningful reports. And yeah. now I, I, I got to understand them. And I have to, of course, I have to understand the traffic to our website and make intelligent decisions based on that. We, don't get me wrong, we track our goals for ticket conversions and all that stuff. But I also prefer to outsource this to much smarter people on my team. Yeah, uh, to to take care of that. Well, I mean, to to be honest, I, I'm pretty sure data is one of those things that um, what we do on a daily basis it's much less impressive than what comes out of our mouths when it comes to marketers, right? Like, I honestly, people talk about it like everybody's such a data scientist, right? And yeah, the thing with with truly understanding data, right? Like, I come from an engineering background, so I did a lot of math in college and that kind of stuff. Um, but it was never my thing. It's never what comes naturally to me. I well, I way prefer that, like the creative work of marketing, right? Like that's kind of like something I get pumped about. And like la la looking at reports, not really, right? Like that's the same thing. Uh, but everybody claims to be some sort of an expert. And the thing is, we did that. There's no sure there is such a thing as knowing like a little bit. The problem is that a lot of people know very little and pretend that they know a lot. Right, so mm -hmm. a lot of people grab a set of data and they go like, this is what we should do because the data says this or the other. And data, when you take it completely out of context, just stops meaning anything, right? Yeah. Uh, it's better to have no mathematicians in your company than a shed mathematician in your company. Right. You know what? That's why I, I would rather pick up the phone and call my customer, right? And like really ask him what exactly it means, right? Why are you coming 100%. back to the conference? And you know, to get that answer rather than spend hours and hours. Especially Google because Analytics. you're not a massive like B two C e commerce, right? That you get this amazing flow of people that you can just actually make those conclusions. Uh, yes. for an event that has a few thousand attendees here or a, a, in every edition or so on, right? Like you're not going to be able to draw something statistically significant out of, out of like looking at your data. It's really difficult. There's, there's a couple of things about data that I wanted to, to, to talk to you about. So the first one is that I believe that people love being data driven when it suits them, right? So when the data says people hate your product, then we start saying things like, well, mm -hmm we're not really measuring that well, right? Like, it, it, that's when we start doubting the data set, doubting the sample size, doubting everything. When the data says they love your product, you're like, oh man, yeah, we're doing a great job, right? So everybody's behind it, everybody's data-driven. 
Um, yeah, the other I remember part, it, yeah, in ahead. our early days, we, we were just measuring MPS. We started to do that. And, you know, <laughs> when we just sent, which is a simple question, the simple way to measure something, right? Ask whether you recommend that conference, you know, or not, yeah. to, to another person, yes or no, or on the scale, one to 10 rate your experience. Very simple, right? So when we got like some, some results, back early in the days that was not satisfactory it's like oh this is bullshit you know this is a wrong sample <laughs> yeah that yeah we, probably we the, the yeah. bitter idiot replied but the guys that love us didn't take the time right like yeah this, exactly this. people are very busy the ones that really care about the content <laughs> because they just studying so they don't have time to respond to the surveys <laughs> i've been in so many meetings where everybody's like data 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 and then the data makes it look like shit and you're like yeah it's yeah, yeah, that's probably that they didn't get it right. They're not our customer. They're not our target, or whatever it is. And and the other one that that's become painfully clear during this pandemic, right? Is that when you take numbers out of context, you can weaponize them to support any ludicrous argument you might have, right? So you say like we are the most loved company in the world. If you want to find data to support <laughs> that shit, you can, right? There, you can find something. You can create some sort of bullshit spreadsheet to support that point. Right, that's the problem with data. And then you say like, yeah, but it's a number, it's data, and therefore it should be the truth. But these numbers, out of like rational mathematical context, context, right, and statistical, you know, value, they mean nothing, right? Yeah. So I guess that's also something that we've seen a lot lately with people saying, you know, my country is doing amazingly well during COVID, and then you're like, well, if you don't even compare it by population, then I guess, yeah. Right, like if, if you have to do these very little things. The other yeah, 100%. thing that grabbed my attention because with guests usually I ask you a few things about your pains that right that you're going through, uh, and I emphasize about the ones that are like kind of your fault and the ones that you couldn't do anything about. And one of the ones that you brought out that really resonated with me was creating processes, right? Efficient processes. Uh, Myself, I always struggle with that. I, I, I think it's extremely hard to find a balance between doing something that will deliver quality, but it's not making you incredibly slow and not making everybody confused, right? So you're like, let's document everything. And then you realize that there's no time to execute anything because you're spending your whole day documenting everything. Uh, what's your struggle with this one? What's the biggest things you're dealing with in that area? You see, the biggest, uh, the biggest challenge for me that I actually understand that I'm doing it wrong, right? Because every <laughs> single time when I sat down and I really thought through, because the right way uh, to do it, when it, whether you're a founder or marketer, right? You, you try something, uh, then you see if it works. Uh, you measure it, you see if it works. If it does, you want to create repeatable process from it. Uh, and then you transfer your knowledge to the team members so they can execute on it. Yeah. So what i usually do when i get something done and i know i see it works then uh maybe i can jump on the quick call and quickly explain it to someone right but it's really hard to transfer that knowledge like that and when they don't understand me fully i get either upset and then i was like okay i'll do it myself because it's <laughs> going to be so much faster but um and uh, sometimes I feel that I also want to add a creative layer to the process every single time to improve on it. So, but I know that every single time I will really sit down, document this process, either by recording a video or putting together a checklist or explaining to the team member, making sure that they really understand it so they can create that ch a checklist. Every single time it's just investing in my future so i don't have to do it again but i don't know i still keep keep doing it maybe because i just like to be sort of a practitioner in a way like deep inside right yeah um, and but i recognize that this is a big sort of growth pain for me and i still do it well i think it's it, it might be also about like being like like a hyped kind of person right like when i get excited about something as well I'm like, I have this fantastic idea, but there's a transition between I can communicate it to others because I need to put it on paper and I need to like make it really cool. And like, I need to put it in a spreadsheet, in, in a, you know, Asana or whatever for people who have their task assigned or anything. Um, and by the way, all of the project management software, <laughs> you hate it. <laughs> I, oh my God. I hate oh man, it so I'm addicted much. to that shit. Yeah. To some are, of it. Well, I'm addicted to Slack, but 
Yeah, I think if I could uh, operate on just Google Docs and Slack, that's it. That's. But I, I do, I do see that, right? Like, I, I, it's it's been taking me a long time, right? Because for me, it would be much easier when I want somebody to do something or when I want to like ask for something to just say to someone, "Hey, could you just please do this?" I, I, I think the issue with the whole slacking, emailing, or whatever. It's that when you don't have something in a single place, you lose accountability a little bit, right? So if that person tells you afterwards, hey, I forgot to do that, and you remember how it happened, and you're like, oh, shit, yeah, I sent her an email, then another Slack message, then it was in a group, uh, then I get out of the group, and I said it to her in her inbox, then I just was like in my car, and I sent it on LinkedIn, or whatever, you're like, well, yeah, of course she forgot, right? That's, uh, that's what my head of operation is telling me every Yeah, you're driving day. her nuts, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or him. I'm not sure who, if, if it's a him or a him. Sorry, <laughs> Allah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're driving her nuts. So uh, that for me has been, yeah, there's that little moment where you're like, oh, shit, I would like to plaster these 10 ideas in Asana or in wherever you put them, like in an instant and just keep going. But you, you have to kind of like learn to deal with like, okay, I actually have to take 20 minutes here and create the task, assign it to the person, put a deadline. I get it, it's freaking annoying, but it also, it gives me more peace of mind, I guess, right? Because also, yeah. it, what, what it does saves me, it's, um, hey, are you done? Hey, did you do this? Because mm -hmm. when there's a system where you like tick it, right? And you say like, then I don't have to ask you, right? It had a deadline and I see it getting ticked and you avoid a lot of the, hey, did it happen? Hey, all the nagging which I'm really good at, right? I, I'm really good at nagging, so I try to avoid that. Um, what kind of processes have recently come up that you've been struggled with? Uh, so for example, a very simple process that really deep down in my head, how to, let's say, create marketing plan for an event and promote the event, right? Yeah. So instead of having a clear timeline, uh, six weeks out, we send one email, actually, Right now we're working on it, so <laughs> we're making some progress towards it. But for the very long time, we didn't have one, and it would be like me uh, jumping with our marketing manager on the call, and uh, okay, we gotta send these emails, like, and she's like, okay, I need to talk to copywriter. Copywriter needs to be needs to we need to make sure he's available to coordinate all of that project with all of the follow up pre event emails. And it sort of becomes a mess, especially given that when I have my creative juices flowing, I keep changing everything. Yeah, yeah. Right? 100%. So, yeah. So that could it, be just one example. There are so many. Well, even when you try to like, I don't know, man, I think it's frustrating because sometimes I try to do like templates, right? So I'll create a template and I'll be like, okay, every time I have to do a landing page, I'll have this template. So then it's ready for, it has everything in there. Who gives feedback? Who has to give this other thing? And for some goddamn reason, like something always kills it, right? Like you're like, I've worked around this template like 20,000 times, but there's always something in our process that changed that particular time and my entire template goes to shit, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then you're like, fuck, I'm not, never going to do this again. And, but it's an ongoing thing, right? I think what I was going to ask you is, that, do you have a, a lot of rotation in your staff or is everybody mostly stable and no. full-timers? Yeah. So... Well, we have a very unique, very diverse and globally global team. So, um, but we really literally had no rotation for the last three, four years or so. That's really so good. the, yeah, like three of us, four of us right now, pretty much full time and even contractors. So one of the, our biggest value within the organization, everybody is uh, sort of an entrepreneur and CEO in his yeah. own world. Some of the people are actually have their own businesses. Some other people are uh, working full-time jobs and uh, they made it work. So they work with us part-time. So yeah, uh, but very, to be honest, the only thing I remember we had to let go of the team member is when their contract expired in the last three, three years or so. Yeah, uh, but do you feel a little bit like if a few of these people left, you would be royally screwed, right? Because because like some of the learnings go with them or some of the processes, right? When you don't have processes, it's easier to to when people leave and somebody new comes in to take over and follow the Absolutely. same guidelines. Absolutely. It, if your key people were to leave tomorrow, you would be royally screwed, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially right now <laughs> when I feel... I feel now is the time when we like really clicked as a, as a team uh, in the face of all of the challenges. And I feel that for the very first time, I, I sort of can step back and look at the big picture when the team executing a lot of things. Right. So creating processes is really important. 
Yeah, man, we all have to get to it eventually. It's a pain in the ass and it always feels like it's prioritary to do the things that will bring the money in tomorrow, right? That's the, the, the way we're all working, right? Chasing the, chasing the growth. But, um, and the other one was earlier in March, we all went remote worldwide because of this pandemic, right? And I could see a lot of companies that didn't have a lot of processes in place, really struggling. And a lot of companies that were, you know, in this kind of flow that everybody knows exactly what they need to do. It's in a tool. Everybody know about it. Like kind of be, okay, cool. Like it sucks a little bit, but fine. And, we, and getting adjusted to it. How did you adjust? Was it, was it transition smooth because you guys always have worked a little bit remotely or was it a pain? We always worked remotely. In yeah. fact, uh, we always, we would have a co-working space, which um, I would use and some of the team members would use only for meetings. And just to break down that routine from working at home, but the whole team was trained to work remote, different time zones, everything, no problem. So definitely, it wasn't definitely the that wasn't the biggest big deal. challenge. <laughs> the biggest challenge that we faced uh, during the pandemic. It wasn't uh, that. Yeah. No, I can. Yeah, yeah, probably. I, that makes sense. Other thing that that really caught my eye was that you were saying you were qualifying yourself as a slow learner. Right. And I was really I was really laughing when I saw it because I was like, I don't know, man, when when, when I do these these invitations, I, I never know how who is going to be like super honest and really say like, yeah, I'm really shit at this and who is going to be like a little bit more careful. And I was really happy to see this one because I feel like this one is one that requires quite some confidence to put out. Right. To say, like, I, I, I learn slow. So first of all, what do you define like a, like a slow learner, right? I'm really interested in why you think that's the case. Yeah, so I was actually thinking about that concept for a very long time. And so, like, you know, everybody knows Tim Ferriss, four-hour work week, and his um, sort of approach, try to learn from the best, maybe like not from the, uh, the, the best in the world, but from the second best, because that person is easier to reach, yeah. right? And try to really jump into it and learn everything very, very quickly. So in my case, the way, what I call the art of slow learning is uh, instead of uh, trying to learn something very quickly from a person, but it's more about emerging yourself in, into environment where uh, these people hang out, like super smart people, and yeah. not necessarily learn very fast, but rather observe them and talk to them about life and see like connect the dots on how they behave and then eventually overhearing some of the conversations and then maybe understanding them slowly and starting very slowly to participate in them. That's that's really how I learned marketing, right? So I also mentioned in that when, when you ask me a question, I don't consider myself as a growth marketer, as a founder of the Growth Marketing Conference, not a growth marketer. So sometimes I get requests to the podcast, like, let's talk about growth. What kind of experiments <laughs> did you run, right? We talked about data. I mean, to be that, honest with you, man, that's even a shit out question for me, right? Like, I, I hate being on, on any sort of like, like conference or whatever, where people ask like, what's your best hack, right? Like that's, yeah. I just like, I don't have anything to say, man. I, I just work my ass off. Like, that's all I do. I, I don't really have like a single golden hack, hack right? It's, uh, yeah, it's but also going back to slow learning, right? It's, it's really, for me, is also, on the other hand, it's about sort of, it's how you learn uh, to drive a car or how you learn to ride a bicycle, right? You're not going to do it for the very first time. Uh, when you jump on it and you sit down. So it's for me when I learn cooking or for even martial arts, right? I usually, I don't understand anything from the very beginning. It's hard for me to process with my brain. But when I start moving exactly the same way, and then when sort of it becomes internalized, and for that, for the process of learn learning, it's really important to understand, um, to know yourself in a way and understand what is yours, what you can accept, and what can you have to reject. So this is kind of also a process of that slow learning. But when you something clicked for you and you know you need to learn that, then you do everything to internalize it. So sometimes I use uh, combinations of just taking a very intense boot camp on something, right? And then this is like fast learning. And then at the same time, complement it with slow learning by being a part of that, keeping conversation going with the people, being around them, and keep repeating it uh, over and over again, putting yourself in the same environment. 
Yeah, I mean, what what I truly love about what you're saying is is that you fully embrace it, right? Like, there's no there's no uh, resisting it. There's like, dude, this is the way I learn best. So this is this is just me. And also, I honestly feel like you might not be a slow learner, right? Like, I feel like this is the way more like everyone learns, right? It's just that we're in this world where everybody's bragging about how many books they read a month or putting their diplomas of online courses online. And then it's, it's fairly easy to feel like a moron, right? Because you're like looking at all of these things there and be like, wow, man, like I've been watching Netflix this whole weekend and everybody did three courses. My, my, my question when I see these kind of things is like, how much do you really retain out of that, right? Because if you're listening to three podcasts while you run and then you like listen to an audio book, which I'm not a big fan of, and then you look at a YouTube videos, chances are your brain retained like 5% of that shit, right? So is it better to like overload your head with like a bazillion things just so you can tell everybody that you did every course there is to know about everything? Um, or is it better to take your approach, right? An approach where you say like, dude, I want to learn this well and it will take me what it takes me until I internalize it, you know? Yeah, and you know what's interesting? So I'm actually a huge fan of audiobooks and podcasts. So I yeah. listen to them a lot, yeah, all the time. And uh, I'm actually a little bit embarrassed that, you know, I probably read one book every three months or so, like physical book. But I do listen to a lot of audio books. And the way I think of it, I don't retain maybe 95% of information. But that 5% that really register for me when I'm doing my morning run, yeah. I, would, I would really come back and I would write it down. So, yeah. And I just, so I'm definitely more of the auditory learner. Yeah. So, yeah. It's interesting. I had a conversation with a friend of mine the other day about audio books because that's where I go up a little bit like grumpy old man and go like oh you they're not shit and blah 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 um yeah the thing is if i'm listening to something uh, my mind is gonna go every place right it's gonna ooh bird right it's just gonna start wondering i need to have like all of my senses like in something to like process what i'm reading that's kind of like me he was making the argument that it might even be uh more than you retain and that it might be faster so we had this like WhatsApp argument about it the other day. I was like, nah, that's bullshit, blah, blah, blah. And I was like checking it out in, in like Google and apparently faster, it's not because apparently you can read faster than, than what somebody can speak to you to make it nice to listen, right? So when they record audiobooks, they also record them in a tempo where it would be nice to listen and it wouldn't be like somebody like me, like blah, 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 blah like all the time, right? Uh, but by the way, that's how I listen to my books. On you one, put them in uh, speed? 2x, 1.5x, oh, yeah. Oh, I don't know tell it's me horrible, this, but yeah, Don't yeah. tell me this shit. Okay, but it's, well, yeah, but I, I, it makes sense. I mean, to whatever works, I think the point is that there's this content overload out there, right? And but you know, I want to just mention on that. So very it. important for all of the audiobook uh, sort of listeners and lovers and those, well, and those who may be haters too, who have never really tried it. I, I think haven't. it's very important to, when you do that, it's, you cannot combine it with the activity that require some other mental uh, attention and like, you know, for, for your brain to respond. Right. You can you can do it when you run, you can do it when you wash dishes, you can do it when you clean apartment, you can do it when you jump on the trampoline, for example. I just recently got trampoline you got a trampoline? Amazon. Okay. Yes, I did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which is, I don't know if it's bullshit or not, but apparently NASA, it, this is what my wife told me. Can NASA's, we just have this conversation while you're in the trampoline? Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> I could literally was going to jump there right now. It's right next to me. But uh, yeah, anyway, so apparently NASA scientists said that uh, it's uh, you burn fat 50% at the higher degree than you run. So I didn't check on that. Really? If you jump on the trampoline for that the same time. Way more zero, fun than, that sounds way more fun than running. It's, it's really fun. You yeah. should try it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I might consider that one. Um, my neighbor won't be happy, probably the, the one below me, but, uh, um, the other thing, so is there like, what's in your learn list, right? Like, because I feel like one of the trickier things right now, it's that, for example, when a new person comes into marketing and I see this all the time with people, when you speak at courses and stuff like that, um, we are demanding from marketings right now that they are like eight professions in one, 
right? We want them to be uh, data scientists. We want them to be UX psychologists. We want them to be behavioral, whatever we want to call it. So we, we call this kind of like the T-shaped player when you go mm -hmm. and you learn a lot of depth in one area and one or the other. What it's doing to people is that it's driving us crazy, right? Because we're all like, fuck, I, I haven't yet read about behavioral psychology for e-commerce. I need to get on that one. I haven't yet about ABM marketing yet or conversational marketing or whatever other bullshit we can come up with, right? So um, what's your take on this one? Are you a super focused in terms of what you decide to learn? Are you all over the place? What is on your list? Yeah, so definitely not all over the place. Um, my take on this is always, uh, regardless what you decide to learn, like lo try to learn from experience. So I would always prefer to learn from people who have done it and also learn by doing it and then supplement it with the books as resources yeah. because uh, and kind of, you know, read the books at the same time as you talk to people. So you're like, OK, so I read that, but it's interesting. It doesn't really work. Let me try it, you know, in my business. What I feel uh, back to your point about T-shaped marketer, right, uh, versus like specialist. Yeah, I think it's both are important, but they also de depend who you want to get or who you want to become on the growth stage of your business and also on the nature of your business. For us, for uh, we as an event uh, sort of business, email marketing is huge for us, right? So I really need to have uh, marketing automation email specialist on my team, very yeah. uh, attentive to the details. So for other business, it could be a SEO specialist. So I don't think it's a wrong or right answer there, but the main takeaway is, yeah, is really learn from people who are really good at and complement it rather with books. And I think I, I would still be more focused on what I learn. Although, again, I'm fascinated with uh, approach. I know we're going to talk about some of the resources. And yeah, 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 don't give so them all away. Uh, don't give them all okay, away. Okay, so, so I'll save with that. But so, there's some, some, uh, uh, people that I respect, they recommend that, you know, you can just learn from everything. You pick up any book from the library, start reading it, and you can learn something. So I'm far away from it. From the right library now. of audiobooks. The one you go oh, to. Like the library books. of audiobooks. Physical <laughs> books. If you go to this, like, a library, so I, I guess this is like the art, the ninja, you know, the <laughs> sensei of uh, reading books and learning is somebody who yeah. can really... Uh, go to any library, physical space or, uh, you know, audio library on Amazon, download any book and find a valuable concept very quickly from the book and understand it very quickly. Yeah, but you hit the nail on the head on that one when, when you say like about what your business needs, right? And I feel like a lot of marketers, in order to prove themselves, they feel the pressure that you need to like know all the latest stuff that's going on in marketing, right? So when anything new comes out, comes around, you're like, dude, I should get on it. I should know everything about it. Very often, like 100%, like 90% of businesses get their biggest growth from one or two channels, right? Yes. Like, like there's no business, well, few, some of the biggest ones, but smaller businesses that have like 10 successful channels. Right, so when you're running around like a headless chicken trying to understand everything there is about ABM marketing, everything there is about email, everything there is about chatbots, everything there is, and you don't really focus on maximizing your growth in the couple of channels that are gonna get there for you, that's the lost opportunity, right? Because uh, it's very easy, I guess, especially for younger marketers to get lost in like, ooh, somebody posted about this one, I should get on it. And, and then you do the course next morning, right? Well, if you were spending that time in those two channels that you know work for you, that's the gold mine right there, right? 100%. So, yeah, that, that's, that's what I think it's tricky for me is that we have fairly limited brains, right? We try to think that we are like, you know, we have like unlimited hard drives, but you just cannot retain everything. And also from, from this lower learner approach or like from the audiobook approach you were saying, like, it's also fine to make peace with not catching everything on the goddamn book, right? Like, you, I've done it myself as well. I, I, I read it on a Kindle, sorry for the purists as well, but I, I always like highlight a bunch of shit. 90% uh, mm -hmm. of the times I never come back to it. Once in a while I need to do a presentation and I'm like, ah, oh, what kind of inspiration I can take from my highlights, right? But um, you, you're like getting obsessed with like, I should kind of like remember this and, even if you don't remember like the exact same thing, it leaves something in you, right? That gets triggered eventually when you need it, right? Or, 
or you might need to reread it later, but that's okay, right? You don't need to swallow these things and like get them in your head. You know, I feel that there's almost like art to learning in a way uh, for and each it's different for each person and you if you really embrace it and you commit to learning eventually uh your brain retains the information that you personally need 100%. on its own so even sometimes i you know i wake up i write down my to-do list or i i have a call with a, a partnership call right and i take some notes and i might never come back to them but it's still it's important for me to take this physical notes for me I, I have I have these notepads just lying around. And when I look at it, I was like, what the hell is that from last year? You know, I, I never look at these notes. No, but, but it's not about moment, that. Yeah. It's, it's about the moment, exactly. Yeah. It's not about looking at them later. Like, it's, it's helping you process what you're hearing better, right? And, and if somebody tells like, hey, you need to remember to this or the other, if I write it down, even though it seems stupid because it does take me a minute and like, hold it, let me just write this down or whatever, like, I kind of internalize it better. I'm not a... I'm not going to try to justify it medically here because I would look like an idiot, but <laughs> there is something to that, right? To like the act of like taking the note and, and engraving it in your brain. Yeah, definitely. All, all right, man, let's get to the tricky topic, right? Like That's you true. are in the event business. <laughs> yes. It's a tough business to be around at the moment, right? So uh, when we exchange emails, you were telling me, uh, you were probably, I, I usually ask people, um, to give me like a personal pains and then business pains separately, right? And you were probably the ones that I didn't even ask. I just wrote there like, I think we both know which one this is, right? Like, mm -hmm. we don't, and I wouldn't add three there because this one gives us enough to talk about. So how has it been? Yeah, so uh, I wouldn't, I mean, uh, I, I would just tell you straight. So it's been really tough. Uh, since March, um, when everything started, well, end of February, March, we were sort of in that uh, mode when we see that something is happening with the event industry. There are two camps. Some of optimists are thinking, okay, this will blow over by summer. We're going to have in-person events. Some of the hardcore pessimists are saying that events are dead completely, <laughs> right? Yeah. So we're still trying to understand what's going on. And uh, in the beginning of the year, we also considered launching two products. Um, and uh, we only had a bandwidth for one of them. So in, uh, and one of them, we, we thought about launching a membership model when we would build an uh, online community. And another one is to organize in-person events for our partners because we were, became really good and efficient at putting together in-person events for other businesses. And right. we chose the second because we already had a, a client committed oh, to it. So it's, it's not, we got affected. So pretty much it was a double um, uh, Double hit. impact yeah when uh first of all you know on that side we had a couple of really big clients who were ready to pay you know a hundred thousand dollars for per project for us to organize events so we on that side and then our sponsors who were about to sign the contracts for the end of the year for our biggest conference in december yeah. also uh, didn't we're not in the rush to sign the contracts. So literally our pipeline uh, disappeared by mid-March overnight. And um, we also in the story wasn't like, okay, so let us just sit down with the team, which we did and let us just regroup and let me let me rally the troops and we're going to completely reinvent yeah. our business and in one month we will quadruple our revenue like i mm. you probably saw some it's not that romantic right it's yeah, not as it romantic as it's imagined. not at all yeah it was very probably the most challenging four months i ever had in my life business wise yeah. and uh, i'm very grateful uh for the team that they they really were very committed very patient worked really hard and to be honest we're still sort of in that place where we're trying to figure it out the next event is the first event the virtual event so this is one of the things we always did virtual events in the past but it was completely different business model yeah, it was more top of the funnel uh build engage community give them some content and eventually invite them to attend the conference at the end of the year uh, most of these events were free we just had maybe one or two sponsors for each of them now we have to rely on it as a main revenue source so we still and everybody's trying to figure it out right now. Yeah. So nobody really knows what they're doing when it comes no. to virtual events. 
No, and it's it's also not evolving in a predictable way, right? Like it's such it's so wavy, right? Like so all of a sudden it's like, hey, it's getting better. Fuck, it's getting worse. Hey, it's getting it, it just never ending loop of like good and bad, right? And what I'm interested in also understanding is how you motivate your your team, right? Because you were saying that uh, well, you're a small team, fair enough, but that, but but still, you could have easily like lost half of them uh, the next month. Right, so you yeah. must be doing a good job at, at keeping the guys motivated. How has that been for you? What's what's the learning there? Yeah, so first of all, the team is always uh, one of the core. Um, I I feel that every everybody who joined us at the very beginning, including myself, actually, because uh, originally when I'm not the original founder of Startup Socials, I actually came on board and volunteered first, right. and uh, then I started Growth Marketing Conference, like. Um, on top of that startup socials community. So everybody who came to our team, we never hired somebody by putting um, a job uh, announcement that we're hiring. Everybody came to us and everybody volunteered and contributed to us and, as an organization first, and then we brought them on board. That's really so cool. for that reason, that commitment was sort of from the get-go and everybody, some people, Actually, stop taking uh, compensation, and they were still. Wow. They just. They. We just want to make sure that we stay in business. So, and uh, gradually, as we started to generate some revenue, um, we. I was able to bring some of them on board, more or less. But also, how to motivate the team? Actually, for one person, I we had to let go, but I was able to find him a job. So that's Super sort cool. of. I, I feel personally, this is my commitment to the team members. But and I think. Uh, on the other hand, uh, also, we, we decided at, at some point we just sat down and, okay, so we need to generate that revenue. Like, no matter how committed we are, we still, uh, this is a business. We yeah. cannot be running a uh, business that where we're losing money. So I said, well, if we generate this certain amount of revenue, we're staying in business. If we're generating like the bigger milestone, we all, whenever it's safe and possible, we're going to be we're all going to Thailand. <laughs> yeah. We're going to Thailand for, for a yeah. week, you know, like all inclusive and uh, as soon as it will be allowed. And yeah, pe people got super excited. And uh, But man, honestly, I mean, it, it's really cool to hear because I feel like in these situations, there's two sides of, of, of the problem, right? One of them, it, it, it's uh, the business, right? Some businesses just freeze and, and that's normal and, and you cannot do shit about it and you have to deal with that. And another business, another side of the business is, is people and people being motivated and so on. So you see organizations that haven't built a, a solid, like, you know, culture, in their organizations, really struggling in these situations because everybody's like, well, the only reason I was staying was because the business is booming, but I actually hate your guts, right? Mm -hmm. And the other ones, uh, and you have the complete opposite side, right? You have uh, a company that just completely draws in revenue and people are even like, yeah, you know what? I, I am actually not take a paycheck this month, but I want to stay, right? And kudos, man, that's like, that's not easy to achieve. And I know it's a small team, but it's still a, a big challenge. Thank you, yeah. I definitely appreciate our team and the loyalty and effort that they put every single day and i think this is the the fact that we are a community driven organization and people is something that is our core value this is uh definitely help us through and yeah. uh, weather the storm yeah the other thing like you were mentioning we i told you in the in the tour of false right like about the whole uh is it the networking or is it the content right so We've seen in the, in, the, in the education industry, for example, like people saying like, hey, I'm paying this 70K a year tuition and I am not getting the full experience. I'm only getting the, the education. And then the organization says, well, you are getting the exact same lecture. And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I don't get to sit in the library with my, with my, you know, uh, my, student, my fellow students and just learn from them. And I don't get that whole experience that I was willing to pay this for, the networking included, right? So... Do you think that just moving events from in-person to online, it's enough? Or do you think the industry will need a much bigger rethinking about how to add the same value as you were adding on in-person events in an online environment? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, a lot of uh, very smart people right now are thinking about how to do that, how to create um, a similar, not similar environment. The environment would be definitely different for connecting and networking. But to be honest, I've seen some examples where um, networking uh, using Zoom breakout rooms was extremely efficient. And uh, I feel that 
there would be some interesting benefits of taking events online and making make them uh, even more efficient as some of the in-person events. Nothing would replace that one-on-one -on -one conversation that you know that you would have at the bar. Um, uh, but I think eventually it would come back uh, in the smaller groups. But at the same time, everybody would realize that it's to to meet somebody and have open conversation. You don't necessarily have to fly and um, to another part of the world, exactly. right? So there would be some technology platforms built, solutions created, uh, new ap approaches, and that's why I'm very excited to see what's next yeah, for our from industry. Breakout rooms to like being to like book an appointment with another dude to chat after the conference in the chat box, right? Like like being able to enable those connections offline because having the connection face to face is not the core of it. It's actually having the time of of like talking to the other person, right? Um, so. It is not often that we get pulled down this hard, right? Like for unforeseen circumstances, because this one nobody really saw it coming, right? And you guys were booming, the business was great, yeah. uh, there was no way down, and then all of a sudden you're like, yeah, well, that was the thing that could have fucked me over, right? What just happened? Is there any is there any learnings or any positive outlook on it that you can already share? I know a lot of these are gonna come in years to come, right? There's, you're gonna see in 2022 with like, oh shit, yeah. I learned that through the pandemic, right? But already, is there an, any positive outlook or learnings that you can take from this experience? Yeah, absolutely. One of the biggest learnings, you cannot just depend on sort of one big event at the end of the year to account for 80% of your revenue. Yeah. So a pandemic could have happened, let's say earthquake could have happened on the week before and the business is gone, right? Yeah. So it's really, it makes me uh, rethink you know, the entire business model as well as um, if I if I would build another business down the road, um, you know, sus sustainability of that business and really making sure that it doesn't depend so heavily on this external circumstances that it's recession proof, pandemic proof. So that's if you start thinking about it from the very beginning as an entrepreneur, um, that's definitely uh, an advantage of this. Uh, for me, I would, you know, if we if we didn't have pandemic, I, I wouldn't start thinking about that. I was like, okay, the business is growing. It seems like revenues are growing, profits are slowly growing too. So let's stay, uh, and we might even suffer more yeah. if something bigger would happen. If if it would happen before our event, we would have to shut the doors. So we didn't have that capital uh, saved to be able to refund all of the tickets to everyone and to our sponsors not to run the event. Yeah. So in, in, in one way, you know, optimist within me said that it's, it might, might not have been, you know, it, it's, it's a huge lesson learned, of course. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, it gives me an opportunity to completely rethink, uh, the entire business model and approach. Yeah. And that's what it's going to take, right? I, I see a lot of people, for example, online courses, right? I see c courses that used to be uh, in the classroom. Now people say, okay, well, now you can still take it and we have this whole state-of-the-art setup. It's amazing and you can take it and contribute and raise your hands and whatever you want. But you might need to also rethink that I'm not, I might not be willing to pay like 3K to go only in an online course that everybody's doing. Maybe a lot of people are just recording it and sharing it with their friends. So like, let's just, you know, what, whatever it is, it doesn't feel as valuable as being in a classroom. So you also need to shift your mindset of like, okay, well, then maybe I need to just charge cheaper, but I also don't have a classroom limitation size here. So instead of 40 people, I can do this for 400 and charge yeah. them cheaper, right? So you need, you need to le really rethink it from the ground up. And I feel like a lot of people are still on that phase where like they're telling themselves that they rethought it because it's like, yeah, we have breakout rooms and so on. It needs to go further, right? It needs to go further to, to like really give the same experience. We just had a conversation, so I'm doing weekly uh, Q&As and inviting actually event organizers and everybody uh, in uh, events industry to learn from them, what are they doing. Um, and we had a great conversation with uh, SVP of marketing at Third Door Media. They run a MarTech conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, something that really I th resonated with me, the way he thinks about it, now is you don't have that physical sort of a time frame with online content and you have to completely jam it in within two, three days. 
you can really position it in a way, this is just one creative idea, as a Netflix for marketers, for example, and have yeah. your conference being run um, over the course of two weeks, right? And as you mentioned, um, charging, you cannot be charging the same as for in-person events, right? But it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a bad thing. If you find your product market fit, you can, um, you can go for global audience. You can really, uh, there's no um you, you can bring instead of 40 people you have you can have thousands of people watching the same content yeah so. because it's it's super easy right like to this is something that's super common as well like it's super easy to talk about it right it's very different different to execute it right so uh the same way i'm just sitting on my chair and being like oh you guys should do x y or z it's like what well, fuck do i know right like i am not really running the business i don't control the the money the revenue and all that kind of stuff but um it's it, I still see a lot of organizations that preach about, you know, like being agile and and and, and shifting uh, really quickly and being able to pivot and like adapting to new technologies and whatnot. But it's 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 very on the surface still, right? Like it's like it's a very aesthetic change. So you can go like, oh, I changed. But below, you still want to keep the same prices. You still want to keep the same the same everything because you're like, yeah, I think it's worthy. It's like rethink it right like think as a student like is it worth it for me to now pay whatever 3k or whatever to go to a course when i'm not even there i'm sitting on my couch there's academies out there for really good courses that you pay i don't know 50 bucks a month or something so yeah. you need to really adapt you know in my and so i just reason uh, recently it's sort of I accepted the fact that is really our old business model is completely dead. It took me a very long time. To it's a do. tough one to even, swallow. Yeah. Even then, we were uh, running this virtual events uh, very quickly in March. We put together one event in April. We got 7,000 people to register. We got another one in June. We're doing one more in August. But I was still thinking, okay, so it's still sort of eventually, you know, it's the same business model. And now I'm just realizing Okay, we cannot do our uh, event in December in person anymore. You have to think about it as a completely, almost like a brand new business. That yeah, you started from but I mean, dude, that's a blessing of a realization, right? Because it's like if, if, I'm, if I'm terminally ill, I want to know, right? Like, and there's yes. so many people that would avoid knowing it. They'll be like, no, 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 I don't want to really hear about it. Well, you, you better do, right? Because you can, you can react, you can do something about it. So good, man. Uh, we're starting to wrap this up. It's been really quick, but uh, it's already going to be almost an hour. So the last bit, it's resources. You were almost spilling the tea on all of them before, so let them out. What are the resources today? <laughs> yeah, so actually one, the first one would resonate very well. Uh, it was a, will be a good se segue from our previous conversation and uh, also from the fact that I, I don't have a checklist and uh, that now is the time to build a sustainable business model and yeah. actually it was meant to look up who's the author maybe um i can look it up quickly right now but the yeah, name of the it. book is uh, uh build to sell and uh, -huh. uh and it's not about just uh building a business that you can sell but it's it's more about building a sustainable business and um the whole the interesting part if specific, specifically if uh, your audience um i'm assuming there would be some marketers entrepreneurs right yeah. who listen to it if there would be agency owners the example of of uh, on that book that is highlighted is a struggling agency owner that is running like a chicken you know from his clients who's telling them what to do then to his team who is doesn't want to do the work right because the processes are not clearly defined then he's really struggling to uh, meet his payroll. But then he talks to a mentor and he gives him, so, well, I don't want to, I don't, don't want to review. No spoilers, no spoilers. Just, no spoilers, but he basically gives him like a process on how to build a sustainable business. And then every single chapter is sort of implementation of that process and very straight to the point, super actionable. So I'm really, cool. when I read it, as I'm building my own business right now. Okay, so this is like almost the blueprint that I need to follow. And uh, it's, it's really resonated with me internally. I'll so, check it out. I'll put the link also in the, in the comments of the video. I mean, from what you're saying, I, one of the positive things I can take out of like the last two years or so, it feels to me like we're gaining back our common sense when it comes to business, right? Like we just went like batshit crazy with 
hyper growth and creating these companies that were never a company, were just financial instruments that you would put some money in that you had to spare and then you would get that double money out. You wouldn't give two shits if everybody got fired afterwards, if it was a sustainable business, it was an investment vehicle, right? And finally, you're, you're based in San Francisco, maybe you've seen more of this, hopefully, um, companies and also investors are starting to stand up a little bit more for profitable, like, businesses that create well-being for their employees and like long-term stability which is what we've known all along right like this is like the concept of business that we've always done like in the 50s right from my dad sarah that i used to see but all of a sudden like just burning cash and going unicorn status and like just having teslas became hot shit and we just lost it right so what you're saying for me really resonates as well you, you know what's interesting on the so you know, a VC angel investing here in Silicon Valley, something that what I'm observing, yes, 100% the trend that you outlined, people uh, looking at this uh, businesses who were able to self-fund self themselves. Yeah. But on the other hand, they also look at the businesses who are COVID beneficiary, right? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. why it's really hard to right now, like if your business moderately affected, and wasn't profitable from day one. It's really because it's becoming really hard to raise capital. You're in that limbo area, right? That you're not like that attractive enough, and you're not screwed enough either. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I see. What, what you, I mean, money is always going to be attractive, right? If you have money to spare and you can put it somewhere and make more money, obviously, it's like one plus one. I get it, right? But at the other at the other side of things, we also need to hopefully uh, come back to the idea that profitability is not evil, right? Like it's okay. It's actually really freaking good to be profitable, right? Like you don't yeah, need to and, grow endlessly. And because the challenge is right now, some of the, a lot of these COVID beneficiaries, I'm talking to some uh, marketers who are running businesses and they're saying that we're not doing anything different. Maybe we're actually doing uh, something, you know, we're working less in a way and yeah. uh uh, but uh, we also what they see right now with all of this growth, right? Uh, they also see a really big churn at the same time. If they don't really, because they uh, often attract customers who don't stay for a very long time. They might stay in the very beginning. So it's I think it's a very dangerous game to really invest in this uh, COVID beneficiaries right now because yeah. you know pandemic will be over eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, but it's always it's always attractive, right? I get it. Do mm -hmm. you do you have another resource to share? Or is that one? Oh you yeah. So the the one that um, I was about to mention, all right. So and this is a new po well podcast that I started to listen recently. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Naval, and uh, it's hosted by uh, founder of Angel List, Naval Ravikant, who is this guy is a genius, and uh, it's just when I started to listen to his podcast, it's almost. Every single sentence that he says, it, it seems like he spent like one hour crafting it. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. almost like a quote, right? And yeah. I think there is one episode specifically. I think it's 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 about it's it talks about how to generate wealth, but it sounds like bullshit. But it's really a lot of wisdom there, and oh, cool. it's based on the his tweet storm that he did. It's a three hour episode. So if you wow. subscribe for Naval, definitely listen to that uh, three hour episode and. I learn a ton. Super just by, cool. Yeah, I'm actually a big fan of like that longer format. I I, I like talking a lot, so I ha don't have an issue with that. I uh, I hear different things, and I also like the, one of the things about working in tech is that you work with a lot of people that are way younger than you. <laughs> so a lot of people that want consume content in like TikToks, right? In like five second things, and and then an hour podcast sounds unbearable to them. But I am a big fan of that one. I am a big fan of like going the long route and and listening to a three hour thing. And he's the guy who's actually, he's the one who recommends, he talks about reading and he's developed that art of reading so he can go to the library, pick any book yeah. and make sense of it, which is, I think it's incredible. I'll definitely pick that develop. up. Cool, man. Um, okay, from my side, there's a, a new book that I found really interesting that I read recently. It's called The Humility Imperative, Effective Leadership in an Era of Arrogance. It's by Dave Balter, the CEO of Flipside Crypto. Uh, it just came out this year, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, but it's super interesting um, because it, it, it gives a lot of stories and pointers of, of how you can be confident, but you can be <coughs> humble at the same time. And I feel especially in these kind of like tricky times, one of the worst approaches to take is it's be like an arrogant know-it-all and, and just being humble 
always pays off, man. I feel I, I feel like it's if more of us would say in a meeting, like, I have no clue what you just said. Could you please explain it to me? Yes. We would be in a different position altogether, right? Like the amount of meetings that I've just nodded my head when I had no fucking clue what I was hearing. And then I was like, oh man, I should have the balls to say something about it. I just have no idea what ATPPTT is. Right, but you're like, oh yeah, cool shit. I love it. Right, so I, I just feel that there's a lesson there for everybody. It's a habit as well as you were mentioning. Right, it's it's hard to not fall on your like nodding and be like, mm, yeah. And you know what? It's interesting that you you brought this up because something my message that I, I'm trying to convey when I talk to our speakers, yeah, when they would deliver a speech from the stage because. It's less of the conversation, but a lot of people are listening to them. And uh, uh, Silicon Valley, you know, product and growth community, so to speak, uh, is very famous for using uh, very uh, uh, the jargon that oh, man. Uh, that's yep. people, you know, marketers. Some marketers don't understand. I don't understand them. So what we're trying to do, we're really trying to more of a democratize growth marketing, like try to explain it in the simple language, right? Yeah. Rather than go in with all of the stuff because uh, somebody, when we have, have a conversation if, and if I don't understand you, I'll probably ask and clarify, but uh, they would unable to do it from this, uh, you know, if people are in the audience. So I well, think it's also, really important. Yeah, it also speaks about how much you dominate the topic, right? Like if you truly understand something, you should be able to explain it to a five-year-old. Right, you shouldn't yes. have to to yes. go to like complicated jargon and algorithmic things to to explain something. That's usually when you don't have any fucking clue what you're saying, and you just want to like cover that up with something that people are not going to be able to call bullshit on, right? But yes. if you truly get it, you'll be able to explain it simply. So, what is the name of the book again? I was trying. It's to called take notes and, the Humility yeah. Imperative: Effective Leadership in an Era of Arrogance by Dave Balter. It's a bit of a long okay. title. I can send you this one later as well. Super cool, short book, uh, a super fun read as well. Lots of cool stories. So that's it, man. That's it for today. Really happy to have you. I really enjoyed having you here. It was a, a revelation of honesty. Uh, I, I'm really happy to see and I wish you all the best. If I can help you in any way to alleviate what you guys are going through, I don't think I honestly can, but I, I wish I could. Please reach out. I would be happy to help. And I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nacho. And same here. Anything I can help, let me know. All right, man. Have a good day. Ciao. You too.